courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's been another weird week for the Calgary Flames, who have now played 70 games, closing in on the end of the season, and we had mixed results this week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Uh, Matt, before we get into each game, overall thoughts on this week? Well, the Flames are in crunch time, and they had three deadbeat-ish opponents. They needed to collect six points. They got four, so the week's a failure. I was mentioning to you before before we came on, it's weird that the two guys the Flames acquired at the trade deadline have been sitting out all week. That's how you know you made some good trade deadline acquisitions when you don't even want them playing. Yeah, well, hey, uh, Stajan and Lazar combined for a game winner, so, you know, that's important. Welcome to Calgary. We have some free popcorn here in the press box for you. Yeah, it, hey, you know, it's one way to keep their value down. It's shows all the other teams that you guys aren't very good so that way hey here's seven hundred thousand dollars so you can stay in the nhl we'll keep you this is you know <laughs> this is how players go to edmonton because these guys are going to call their agents in the summer and say anywhere anywhere else well there's a place up north sure i'll take it that's how edmonton gets players so we we got to be careful what we do but no, I thought it was weird both guys sat out, but we'll talk more about that as we go. Well, at least with Shore, he's been sick. so Yeah, but it, he played one game, and then they sat him back out. Yeah. Um, I wonder if this is like, what was it, McDavid, where they said he was sick for the first half of the season, that's why he sucked? Yeah. That's a long sickness, to be sick for half the season. What's the rest of the Oilers' excuse? Sick by proxy. <laughs> Sick of the crap. That's what my excuse would be. Yeah, well. Well, let's look at the uh, the Flames games this week. The first game of the week, the Flames took on arguably the worst team in the league and ended up with a big 5-1 to one win over the Sabres. The Flames got scoring from all through the lineup here. Bennett got his 10th, Jankowski got his 12th, Geo got his 12th, Monaghan got his 30th, and Dougie Hamilton got his 15th. Um... I don't. This is about what I expected from these two teams. The Flames look like a dominant team, and the Sabers look like a terrible team. And this, if this game had gone any other way, then there would have been a problem. But sure. they, they actually went out, did their work, and everything was fine. Like, the Sabers are terrible. They were without their best player, and they're not very good. And they haven't been very good for a long time. It, they are Edmonton East, and they just are a horrible franchise. Yeah, but unlike Edmonton, they don't have all the best players in the league. Like they're they've sort of got a ragtag group and Kane. Well, Kane got traded, so it's equal yeah. Now there you go. But yeah, but. it yeah their team's not very good. Uh, no, it, you would think that for sucking for his bat bad as they have been for as long as they have been that they'd be better than this but i i think this is a good game for the flames after coming off that pittsburgh game we talked about last week to really show hey we can get the job done and to also keep that momentum going on the road swing so i'm sort of glad the buffalo game was placed where it was because i think it really helped uh the flames keep some momentum going yep then the Flames came back over the border and went to the capital city of Canada, Ottawa, to take on the Senators, another team that has looked... They've had their ups and downs this season, but since the trade deadline, uh, not looking too good as a team. And the Flames ended up managing to get a 2-1 to one win over Ottawa. But I'll give you my thoughts on this first, and then I'll hear what you think. I thought the Flames came out and pushed really hard in that first period. They came out, they looked like a dominant team. I felt like they were still riding the wave of the Buffalo game. They made some mistakes, but overall, they looked a lot better. Then in the second period, they started to fall asleep. They just... Like, they weren't pushing hard, and they let Ottawa back into the game. What do you think? Well, that's exactly the way I see it. The Flames were just as good as they were in the Buffalo game for the first period. And then they, oh, these guys suck too. So we're just not going to start, not need to play hard, because these guys aren't very good. And they managed to hold on for the lead, and Riddick, save their bacon at the end but this is the exact 
type of thing that has caused the Flames to be where they are. They have no consistency in effort, no leadership in the team, and it's the same stuff that we've been harping on week in, week out, all year. One thing I will say that was good is we talked last week about my frustration with the team not putting a man in front when they need one, and I think they did that well on that stage and goal especially. By having a guy positioned properly in front, they were able to get a goal that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. I agree, and that was an excellent play by Lazar to find Stajan in front, and Stajan was in the right place, and sometimes that's all you need. It's funny looking at the numbers on that one. It's Matt Stajan's fourth, Lazar's sixth assist, and Goudreau's 57th assist. Yeah. Like which, which of these things hmm. doesn't belong? Yeah. Hmm. Who got double shifted there? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, who, did, who didn't make their change? You never know. Um, and then I thought... Ottawa really pushed after the penalty shot goal. That really helped them out and got them going. And I thought that there were a few scary moments after that, but I thought Calgary did a good job of really defending their lead and defending in their own zone after that. And as a whole, I thought, much better game than we saw earlier uh, that week. I thought this was one of Calgary's better games recently, probably in the whole month of uh, March that we've seen as far as Calgary defending. Yeah. And it it's one of those things that they put themselves in a bad spot that required them to defend as much as they did. And, like, yeah, they did a good job of defending, but they also stopped attacking at all after a certain point, and they let the Senators, who aren't very good, run around them and dictate the play, and that's never a good thing when you're supposed to be a playoff team. Or vying for a playoff spot, anyway. Speaking of putting yourself in a bad position, the well, this is the, the Islanders game. That this is exactly how it proceeded. Was exactly after watching that Senators game. I actually wrote it down that this is how it's going to play out. They're going to just come out flat because oh, the Islanders are terrible too, and get blitzed by them and. What happened two minutes into the game before people have sat down for their beers and their nachos? It, the game's already over. Before the guys in the press box even have their free popcorn. Sure. There was two early goals, a 214 and 232 into the first that put the Islanders up uh, 2 nothing right away. And I, I, I would say that part of this, I think, was Mike Smith. You could tell in that first period that Mike Smith – looked like he was trying to get his legs under him. And I thought once he finally got his legs under him, he looked good. I don't want to say they were his fault, but there's stuff that I think if Smith was healthy, it would have gone differently. Yeah. And it, I I personally don't think it was necessary to have Riddick or Smith start this game. Riddick played well in both the previous two games. And Smith is obviously rushing back to get better. And if Riddick's doing a good job, you should run with the hot goaltender. And Smith did let the team down, and that's not his fault. He did come back early, and he was rusty. And that happens when you've missed almost a month of action and your your first game back. It's pretty much every goaltender, if what especially with an injury like Smith's, that that's usually how it goes is that they give up four or five goals. I thought by the second he was back to himself. Yeah. Oh yeah. But by then it's the damage is usually done and that's that. So the flames made some pretty big mistakes in their own end, which cost them the win here. But, and tell me if you think you would agree with this. I thought the flames played the better game in this one, but the Islanders had better bounces and that put them ahead. I, I don't think, I mean, even if you look at the shot clock, I don't think you could say the Islanders played the better offensive game here. I think a lot of it was the Islanders got some better bounces, some better puck luck. Well, it, you know, I somehow missed the headline that the Flames acquired Dion Phaneuf and then cloned him a bunch of times with the shots on net in that game. Like, uh, how many shot attempts did they have and how many missed nets? Like, so frustrating when this team is desperate for offense that they're having a hard time hitting the net and that's been a syst systemic problem all season long and it's the numbers i have here are a season high 52 shots on goal and a season high 92 shot attempts it's good that they're attempting more shots but 
the quality of the shots is what matters. And, like, if you're only getting, say, 20 shots a game, but, like, 15 of them are in high danger zones, you're likely going to win that game. Where if you're getting, like, 53 shots like the Islanders game, maybe five of them are dangerous, you're not likely going to win that. And I don't think that the Flames had too many dangerous opportunities in the game against the Islanders. And even though they were racking up the shots left, right, and center, it, you know, Corsi battles be damned. They don't, it doesn't take into effect the quality of the shots. And Well, I mean, that's a good thing to talk about, too. I mean, the Flames played against a goaltender, Chris Gibson, who's playing, who was playing his third game in the NHL. Like, if you can get some, a lot of good shots on this guy, you should be able to put a bunch past him. Yeah, well, you can just imagine, like, the Flames in past years with guys like McElhinney, Irving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, it's the same thing. I've watched Gibson since he was drafted, and he's an all-right goalie, but he, there's not, he's not anything special. Like, he's just your typical filler third-string goal, goaltender who can fill in in an emergency. So, like, there's no reason why this team should have had that kind of performance like they were kind of treating him like Lundquist the other day where they're just trying to pepper him and pepper him and pepper him hoping that he'd make a mistake and they weren't really making life difficult for him because if you're a goaltender of any quality if you can see the shot you're gonna save it and he that's your job yeah exactly and that you have to get dangerous scoring chances where the pucks by the goaltender before he has a chance to react and the Flames haven't, for the longest time, been getting shots from areas that they need to in order to... Because if the goalie can see it, if you're beyond the hash marks, basically, the goalie can see the puck and it's an easy save. And like even for a non-NHL goaltender, it's an easy save. So it's one of those things that, that you need to be in that home plate area right in front of the net and the Flames did not get very many scoring opportunities from there I thought that more than we've seen with other teams and again I think it speaks to how poor of a team they are the Islanders let us in front of the net a lot like there was a lot of times there was a bunch of wide open ice there but as I mentioned last week the Flames often didn't have a man there to capitalize on it no and there was a handful of opportunities where they had clear shots on net where they could have scored but instead opted for a pass or the shot missed wildly and like it's just frustrating because like these games matter and like the islanders are a very beatable team they lost eight in a row coming into the saddle like and they're a pathetic franchise as well so just like buffalo like they're not very good and, you know, it's one of those things, like, these are the teams that you need to be able to beat in order to, like, like when you face LA, San Jose, Anaheim in the next week, like, you have a little bit of insurance in case one of those games doesn't go what, your way, and they're dropping the less games against the less important teams, so now, like, all five of those type of games are now basically must-wins. In order, and five for five must wins instead of having a little bit of leeway. And the Flames have a dozen games left. Now they're basically in this position where they need to win nine of them. And that's just to maybe make it. And that's not realistic. <laughs> well, looking at where they sit right now, as Matt mentioned, the Flames have played 70 games, which means they have exactly 12 left. They have 34 wins, 26 losses, and 10 uh, overtime losses which means that, or overtime or shootout, which means they're sitting at 78 points. And 78 points puts them two points back of Colorado, who has 80 points for the bottom wild card spot. So we're still hanging in there. We're still barely in there. But I don't know. It's it's going to be a tough fight, like you said. And if this team can't beat the worst, how are we expected to compete when it matters? And... The Flames' next opponent being the Edmonton Oilers, we all know how well the Flames have done against McDavid lately. So that's... It's frustrating. And we're not the only ones sensing the frustration. If you read some of the reports from the Flames' practice today on the 12th, uh, they did a morning practice. And obviously, 
Coach Gullitson's feeling it too. He didn't throw a stick around this time, but he's apparently emphasizing a lot of teaching and stopping every drill to ask his team, how are we starting the game tomorrow? Because he felt they started flat against the Islanders. So it's good to see that this is getting on the coach's nerves because the coach, I, I know Gully's a pretty passive guy, but it often seems like he really doesn't care or doesn't have much emotion. So it's nice to see that. Yeah, well... We saw how the Flames responded when he threw the stick. They went out and they won seven games in a row because, hey, the coach was pissed off at us and things went their way. And that's what I was basically saying that the, he he and the coaching staff needed to do in order to be successful is to be able to call the players out when they're playing like crap. And that game against the Islanders, the whole team was playing like crap. And that's not... It needs to be fixed one way or the other, and hopefully they can respond appropriately, especially heading into a very important game tomorrow against the Oilers. Uh, That's a must-win. And, well, they're pretty much all must-wins from now on out, but... It's just frustrating to see this team having at game 70 the same problems that they had in game four, game five of the season. Like back. Well, to me, it's just that inconsistency. Like we see flashes of this team being brilliant. We see flashes of this team, you know, doing amazing things. And you look at them and say, okay, this team could win, you know, a Stanley Cup or this team could go far. And then you see them, you know, barely being able to hang on against the worst teams. And it's like, what's going on here? Like, where was that Flames team we saw two games ago? Yeah, well, that's why, like, last season, um, Brian Elliott called the team schizophrenic because you just never know what you're going to get with these guys. And like on paper, the these players should the Flames should be one of the top four teams in the Western Conference and battling for Vegas for the division. But the lack of consistency of effort throughout the lineup has caused the team to struggle and just cough up points left, right, and center to the point where we're 70 games in and it's not looking good. Well, I mean, we'll talk more about this in our end-of-season wrap-up, but my big question right now is this isn't the first season that we've seen this inconsistent. Like you said, Elliot pointed out last year. So, where you know, is this a coaching issue? Is this an issue with the players in the ice? Like, I think at some point we have to figure out what is causing this inconsistency and address that. Oh, definitely. And you know, I mean, yeah, we've got some good players here, but if they can't play for 82 games, then we need to find better players who can. Yeah. Well, it's also in- interesting to note that the Flames under Bob Hartley were fairly consistent in their play each game. And like they uh in 2015 and 16, if it wasn't for Jonas Hiller and Yanni Ordio not being of ECHL caliber, then the Flames probably would have made that the playoffs that year as well. And so, like, the team was fairly consistent. The system wasn't very good, but at least they brought it every night. And ever since the coaching change, it's been up and down, left and right. And you just don't know what you're going to get from period to period, minute to minute, shift to shift. And... It's frustrating to see because based on talent, this team should be significantly better than they are. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, it, you look at this team coming into the season and it's like, yeah, what has happened here? You know, where, like you said, on paper, this team looks good. So where did they go wrong? What's happening? And you and I don't know enough about what's going on behind the scenes. Is there, you know, what people call dressing room cancer? Is there somebody who isn't doing what they need to be doing here. Like, you know, what are the issues that the Flames are encountering and how do we address those? And I think that's the, and and we'll talk more about that at the end of the year, but I think we really need to look internally and say, what is this team's problem? Who is this team's problem? And get rid of those players. Yeah. But I'm convinced it's becoming a a player issue. I think it's a little bit of, 
A, a little bit of A, a little bit of B, and a little bit of C at this point. For sure, but I just don't think you could switch a coach and things would be fixed. No. I think the Flames still need to add a legitimate right winger, and maybe two, and get uh, like another two top nine forwards that are legitimately good top nine forwards in order to be set. It's just finding those pieces and having them fit. When talking about the inconsistencies here, interesting stat. Uh, the Calgary Flames have a season record of over 1,000 missed shots. Like, yeah, I know the net is pretty small, but you you shouldn't be missing that many shots. And it sort of goes with what I was talking about last week of not having the guy in front. You'll see this team, especially the defenseman, just blasted towards the net. And it's like nobody's expecting them to do it. And then the puck goes in the corner. The other team takes possession of it. So... You know, we need those shots to be on net. And it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you can miss it once in a while, but I almost feel like if we're getting over a thousand missed shots, you got to ask what's going on here. Like, should we be making an extra pass or what do we need to be doing to get that number down? That just seems like a crazy number to me. Well, the Flames have gone to the Dion Phaneuf school of power play shooting. <laughs> I mean, that's 15 missed shots or 14 and a half missed shots per game. I know. Like, that's just ridiculous. And yeah. And if you can get even seven more actual good shots on net, your fortune is going to change in a lot of these oh, games. Oh, yeah. Like, you just have to get any shots towards net. And, like, if you have somebody in front, like, that creates havoc and that leads to good things. And over the course of a season, I. The, the missed shots have probably cost the Flames five or six points. Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of times, and you probably do too, where, you know, our defensemen just have the puck, they see a forward challenging them in the offensive zone, and they just rip it towards the net. And, you know, maybe the better thing to do is pass down the boards to a forward or, you know, do something instead of missing that net because that's often how we turn it over in the offensive zone. Well, that's where I don't like Corsi and I've always been somewhat critical of it because that it treats that as a positive result one way or the other even if it, that's not actually helping you in any way shape or form and like the more important thing is puck possession and con uh, how long that they control the play and zone pressure time not just uselessly racking up oh they took a shot yay you know like i can take the shot from my own blue line and it counts as a positive thing like that's it's just frustrating because it's like the team's being obsessive over racking up the coursey points instead of like actually trying to do the things that make you successful reminds me i don't even remember what level it is when kids start playing contact hockey and it reminds me of kids who start to play contact hockey where they've got the puck, they're all excited they've got the puck, and then what happens is some kid comes to hit you and you just quickly fire it on the net. And it, it does you no good. Like, you know, we need, we need I think, that extra second to think. I mean, pass to your defensive partner or even put up the boards, but have the, maybe the Flames need to work on a, a system where they know what's coming. You know, because so often they put up the boards and the players aren't f looking for it. And then we got to go fight to get it back. And we're wasting time, especially in those last five minutes of a game. Mm -hmm. um, another bleak stat here is we talked, you and I, way back when, when the Flames had their CBA mandated bye week, of how they were doing really well going into the bye week. Since that bye week, the Flames have now played 29 games and only won nine of them. So I don't know if it's just the midseason. I mean, you know, good teams are good all year, poor teams are poor all year. I don't know if it's just the Flames showing that they're a mediocre team, but, you know, nine wins in 29 games since mid-January, that's the record of a poor team. I just, it's frustrating to look at it and, you know, see those kind of numbers. And it's like, we know this team can play well. We've seen them do it. So why can't we do it night in and night out? Well, you know, that stat was so shocking that I had to actually go pull up the flame schedule right now, which I did not have open. 
and do the counting. Double check my math? Yeah, just because that is completely unfathomable. Like, the Flames have basically been playing like the Arizona Coyotes since the mandated break. Like, come on. Like, that's pathetic. That's what, 30%? They've won 30% of games, roughly. Yeah, like, that's... Uh, oh, here, let me count. One overtime loss. This is going to make for a great, uh, great podcasting. But while Matt's counting, I mean, you know, if you if you break the season up, that's 30 games. So, you know, we break it up into, you know, two 60-game sections. That's 18 games in 60, 60 games if you go on that trajectory. That's not the number you need to win the playoffs. You can't be relying on hot streaks, which seems like this year and last year is what the Flames are relying on is, oh, we'll get a hot streak. We'll get seven games. We'll get eight games. Like, you know, you've got to be able to play consistently night in and night out. And if they can't do that, it's like, well, what are we doing kidding ourselves? Like, if we can't, you know, if we're winning nine games in 29, what what are we doing here? They had six overtime losses as well. So, you know, that's a little better. But, like, overall... But a loss is a loss. Yeah. It's like going 12 and 17. If you, like, for sake of ease, for total points, like, that's... Yeah, I mean, at least you're at least you're getting one point, but if you look at, you know, serious playoff teams, you don't get into the playoffs by, you know, getting the loser points in all your games. Yeah. You've got to be getting two. And especially because since then, we've played a lot of Western Conference teams and a lot of weak teams, and those are the games when you've got to be able to get the job done. And if we can't, it's like, well, you know, who are we kidding here? Yeah, I know. And, like, that's why the flames are in such a tough spot like you can't play 30 games of a season at basically the level of the arizona coyotes and expect to be successful like i said if you if you sort of and i'm just doing rough math here but if you take that same number and you project it over an 82 game season you've got about 25 wins well, uh, to look at the, the Flames for the point percentage, 24 points in 29 games, and do the math, if you times it by the 68 games that the Coyotes have played, uh, the Coyotes have 55 points, the Flames would have had 56. So they're literally, over that, that stretch, they're playing at a pace that's one point better than the worst team in the West. So and the league. So if you've got a if you've got a good first round pick, that's not a bad pace to play at. If you're looking to use that pick, um, you know, to draft high. But when you're a team that's calling yourself a playoff contender and a team that, you know, is telling fans, "Hey, we can do this," that's a terrible trajectory to be on because that's not. I mean, that's not going to get you anywhere near the playoffs. It's going to get you near Rasmus Dahlin. Yeah. Or which Brady side do you Which side would you rather be on? Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a little alarming. Yeah. Is this team is better than that and like why they've fallen off the face of the earth like this is beyond me. Like, well, and again, it's like if we don't have the right guys, if Goudreau and Monahan can't play an A2 game schedule, then let's move on from them and let's find guys who can. Well, that's actually one of the things that if the Flames miss the playoffs that and I wouldn't be moving Monahan, but you know, we'll have that conversation for a later date. Why don't we have a different conversation? Move a little bit away from the bleakness, and instead grab our crystal balls and look to next season. And coming into this season, you and I had mentioned how the Flames were going to have a log jam in net. It's going to be even worse next year with Nick Schneider turning pro. I think, and we talked about this way back in August and September. The Flames brought in Eddie Lack simply as a stopgap to give their guys more time in the AHL, give their guys more time to uh, develop and you know do what they need to do in the AHL to be NHL ready. But I think now there's no dispute. Somebody's got to graduate. Do you agree? Like you, you can't keep all these guys in the A and three guys in the E. Oh, definitely. They have to graduate and they probably have to move on from one of them as well. 
So, you know, right now we've seen, and I think in some ways it's, even though it might not be good for the Flames this season, I think it's been a blessing for the organization to be able to evaluate both Gillies and Riddick in the NHL side by side. Because how often do you get that chance to say, okay, we've seen them both, you know, in the NHL at the same time to make a fair comparison. Well, also it helps both of those players to learn what they have to do to get better for next year. And, you know, you can theoretically say, oh, I need to do X, Y, or Z. But if you're not facing the, the opponent, you don't know exactly what you're facing until you get there. And with each of them getting a handful of games in, they know, okay, I have to do this, this, and that in order to be a NHL caliber goaltender and they can go to work at it. And with Gillies, it's some positioning issues with Reddick. It's consistency issues, but that's good to know. Well, we, we asked our fans last week, if they were the GM, who would they make the backup goalie next year? And we had quite an overwhelming result. Um, I think the most overwhelming we've had of any poll this season. 72% of you guys said that David Riddick should be the Flames' backup next year. 9% said John Gillies, and 18% said Tyler Parsons. Nobody thought Mason McDonald, and nobody thought the Flames need to look outside the organization. So, Matt, I'll put my flag in the ground here. I'm still the same thought now that I was coming into the season. I think the job is John Gillies. I think Gillies is the better goalie. We saw, I saw at least in the pressure scenarios since Smitty's been out, Gillies looked better under pressure. Gillies looked better in those big pressure situations and big pressure games. And like you said, Gillies didn't. And I think, especially as a backup goalie, consistency is so important. You never know when you're going to have to play. You've got to have a guy who's consistent. I think David Riddick was found gold in that the Flames didn't spend a draft pick, didn't spend an asset to get him. And I think that there's going to be a market for Riddick. So if it was me, I would keep Gillies, bring him up, send Riddick out, and give Parsons the HL job. I don't think Parsons is quite ready. Yeah, it's one of those things where I could conversely see the opposite, where Riddick has done a decent enough job where you could keep him as the backup next season and use John Gillies as a trading piece for something else as well uh, because Gillies will have more value uh, and it depends on your confidence level in Tyler Parsons being that guy who's going to be like the starter moving forward so it basically it depends on how well Parsons does to determine how everything goes yeah, I don't know. I think Parsons, too, we have to remember has, and we've talked about this before, but Parsons lost a pro season, right? He had his injury, he lost his pro season. I think he should be further um, further down the road of development than what he is. But I don't know. I I like Parsons. I I like um, Riddick. I like Gillies. It's, it's hard from a fan perspective to say, let's move on from one of them. I think that goalies, as you've mentioned a lot of times, can take a while to develop. And I guess I'm just looking at who has the better potential upside. I think at one point we all thought, okay, you know, Gillies is the go-to guy for the future. Now I think we're all thinking Parsons is probably that guy. So the question becomes who becomes your longer-term backup? I think we'll be one of those teams that's the same backup for five, six, seven years. And I don't know. I just I can't see Riddick lasting the test of time. I don't know why. I think he's... I think he's a bit of a flash in the pan. Well, we'll see. Uh, uh, there's still a lot of hockey to Which be Which one would you do next year? Uh, I'd probably go with Gillies, but if it was Riddick... I, I Honestly, I think it really matters who does what in the preseason next season and who seems more ready. Because it, goalies are so volatile, you can kind of pencil in one guy to be awesome and the other to be mediocre, and it can end up being the exact opposite. So, well, I was going to say, like, with Eddie Lack, like, I think the Flames were expecting him to bounce back a little bit from his Carolina experience, and instead he did not. And I expected know, it, better from Lack. Yeah. 
Um, and I think you have to realize, I mean, Riddick and Gillies are both rookie goalies. This is both their first year in the NHL. So there's going to be things that have to be worked on. Um, I could see, you know, you were mentioning Gillies is probably worth more on the open market. And I agree with that. I think, though, this summer the Flames have some bigger pieces they need to move. That I don't think they're going to be clamoring for, you know, oh, this is the only movable piece. Let's move them. But I could see Tree very easily saying, you know what? Let's shop them both. Whichever one gets taken, he's gone, and we'll keep the other. Yeah, I agree. You know, make me an offer for Riddick. Make me an offer for Gillies. Different teams, whoever makes me the better offer, you get that goalie, I'll keep the other one. Yep. Um, For the 18% of people that voted Tyler Parsons, what are your thoughts on that? To me, I think Tyler Parsons is a goalie that's something special, and as much as we as fans want to see him in the NHL, I don't think you do him any favors at this point of his development sitting on the bench for 60 games. I think this is a kid who needs to play, needs to play night in and night out, and the best place for him next year is the American Hockey League. I agree wholeheartedly. And he, if the Flames run into injury troubles, then I could see him being that, who's that type of guy like Murray in Pittsburgh where he just comes out of nowhere and, hey, who is this kid? But it doesn't help him. Like, he needs to kick ass in the A. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a very different discussion this time next year because we still have Smitty on contract for one year. So the question, I think, this time next year becomes, you know, does Parsons get called up? Do we run, say, a Gillies-Parsons or Gillies, or sorry, Parsons-Riddich pairing? Or do we go out and find yet another veteran goalie? But I, I think well, I that... Think that- something would have to happen in a very negative fashion for the Flames to get another veteran goaltender at any point other than as a backup. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, I think they might do it. I mean, this team likes veteran goalies. I could see them doing it for one year if they think Parsons needs another year of development. True. I mean, you don't have to get somebody long-term, but I could see getting somebody and even... Like you said, almost in a backup role, say, look, we got a good goalie here and we got a young goalie. You guys proved us who should start. But, yeah, I, I I think in the end, two, three years from now, we're going to be talking about Parsons-Gillies as our tandem. I agree. That's just my and it'll be. I think it'll be considered much like Anderson and Gibson in Anaheim, where both are very good goaltenders with different styles of play. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing here, looking at these two, Calgary likes their draft picks. Calgary Flames like to keep their guys around and Gillies is drafted here. And, you know, this organization puts a lot of value on that. So right, rightly or wrongly, I can see them, you know, making that decision to say, you know what, we drafted this kid. Let's give him more shots maybe than the other guy. I don't believe they brought up Riddick this year because he was the better goalie. I believe they brought up Riddick this year potentially to give Gillies more AHL time, um, you know, in that define number one role yeah i agree you know i think they were saying look you guys are splitting time we're going to bring on mcdonald's or somebody you're now the number one this is your job so show us what we can do with it and um you know we'll, we'll see what happens but i think it's a really interesting discussion going forward and i i always like to have this discussion with people because i mean you and i remember a few years ago even on the show having the discussion of is the flames cl- cupboard empty and when we looked at the empty cupboard it was always the goaltending that was the most empty. And now we're in a position, you know, 30 other GMs wish they were in where we, you have so many goalies, you don't know what to do with them. I mean, you know, this year we didn't even know where to put everybody. And now you got Nick Schneider who, you know, I think will be in the ECHL next year. But it's like, if we need to trade something off, it's going to be a goaltender just because I think we've got so many of them. Same thing with the defense where we have so many good young defensemen that you could let a veteran go but we've thankfully we didn't have to give up a whole whack of picks for our goalies though true i mean those defensemen have cost us dearly yeah and we'll see this year if it was worth the cost or not yeah so yeah i mean you've always said matt you know every year you think the flames should draft a goaltender until they find the right one goalies are very hit or miss yeah i think we're good for now you, you've got you've got everyone turning pro this year. I think you almost need to get you know once um, once Schneider's turned pro. I think you got to get a guy. I think you could just like give it a year, or like if there's a UFA guy that's in uh, 
the juniors that wasn't drafted that like Schneider. Maybe you could go that route, but I, I don't see any need to. I think at this point it'll be tough to convince a UFA goalie to join our log jam. Well, you can say, hey, we're going to need guys down the road three years from now. So I could see them taking a U.S. college guy who then we've got four years of rights yeah, on. Yeah, that's possible too. Either way, like where you know, I, like I don't think that you'd use anything more than like a fifth or sixth round pick on a goalie, but you know, that's our second or third pick. So yeah, I was going to say for the flames, yeah. that's when they're going to get started. Our draft coverage this year is not going yeah, to be very exciting. <laughs> you know, tree and the team can just fly into the draft the second day. They can avoid, you know, all the airport traffic on the first day, go for a nice breakfast, show up at like 1 PM, make their yeah. picks. They're out of there awesome. by three. All that money, all that money we save, we can yeah. put towards a new arena. Um, well, let's move on and talk a little bit more about less depressing things like we were earlier. The goalie coverage, I think, is exciting because it's always good to talk about young guys. Another thing that's exciting is, uh, I guess there's good and bad to this one, but the Flames' current injury report. The exciting thing is Versteeg is back on the ice without his no-contact jersey, which means he's probably about ready to go. And today at practice, we saw Versteeg, Jankowski, Hathaway trio which would suggest that number 10 is probably about ready to get back into the lineup. Um, if he is, where do you think you'd put him? Do you think you'd put him yeah, on that third line? I think it depends. I don't see, like, if Monaghan or Backlund are out, then I think that's what the third line will end up being. But I am hopeful that Kachuk, Backlund, and Monaghan's maintenance day today was just that and nothing more severe. Um,. A line of Bennett, uh, Jankowski, and Versteeg wouldn't look too bad. So, yeah, I could see trying that out, um, and that goes to as you were mentioning the the worries about some of our top guys. Today, we saw in the last game against the Islanders that Kachuk left early after getting hit pretty hard. I'm hoping it's just concussion protocol, and they said, you know what, this game's out of reach. Why put him back in there? But today at practice, we saw three of the Flames' top stars out with, as they're saying, maintenance days. But uh, you never know. you got to read between the lines on that one. And we saw Kachuk, Monaghan, and Backlund all off for a maintenance day. And my worry is, crap, if we're trying to take on the Oilers without Kachuk, hey, Monaghan, and level, Backlund, it's a level you're pretty field. much... <laughs> but, I mean, you're pretty yeah. much asking for another L there. At least... At least if you're uh, Nick Shore or Chris Stewart, you know, you're probably making it in the lineup. Hey, no more popcorn for them. Tanner Glass might even make it in the lineup at that point. You know it'd be desperate when. And, you know, you might think, well, the Flames should make some calls to the AHL and bring up someone we've seen here already in Andrew Mangiapane, but that's not going to pan out either. Mangiapane is now out for the season with a shoulder injury. He's going to have to have some surgery on it, so he won't be back. But, you know, good for him. He's He got an NHL look. He had a really great AHL season. So I guess if you've got to be shut down early, you know, you, you, you had a very productive yep. season before I think you're that. looking at our fourth-line left winger starting next season. So, Yeah, we'll see. Um, I, I think... I think it's tough to tell. I think the big question there is going to be how much are the Flames willing to do over the summer to move out some of the ineffective pieces. And I, but that's another discussion I have down the road. Um, well, why don't we uh, why don't we put out our poll for this week? We talked about last week's. This week, we want to ask you guys, with everything that's been going on and looking at the schedule coming up, how do you feel about the Calgary Flames' playoff chances? Do you think they'll barely sneak into the postseason? Do you think they're going to win at least one round? Do you think they barely miss the playoffs? Or do you think they're going to fall hard and we're going to really regret giving the Islanders a high lottery pick? So, tough one there. It's... Uh, as a fan, it's an interesting season to watch, but it's also a very frustrating season. You know, you hope your guys sneak in and become that Cinderella, but, I mean, with the inconsistency they're having, you never know what's going to happen right now. It's pretty much... Well, the thing is, is that, as bizarre as it is, if the Flames do go on a streak, they could end up with home ice advantage. Like, it is that close. It's not likely. But but, but even but... if they go on a streak, are you convinced they can win four and seven? If they get the right matchup, in sure. some ways I don't want home ice advantage because we don't do well at home. 
Let's start the season on the road. Yeah. I my ideal would actually be to be the eighth seed and fight, face Nashville in the first round because they're the only good team that we actually do well against. <laughs> there you go. I think if you have that playoff spot, you got to book them a hotel in Red Deer or something to make it like a road game. Everyone buses to the rink for a couple hours. Yeah. So even when you're home, we're you're not going staying to in your book house. you in Edmonton. Have fun. <laughs> Well, I mean, do Airdrie or do, you know, somewhere around Calgary, but don't have the boys at home. Put them in yep. undisclosed locations. So the wives and kids can't find them. Yep. All right. All right. Cell phones in the bag. We're going to blindfold you and take you to your rooms one at a time. All it is is like the holiday in down from the dome, but nobody knows that. Yep. Um, so let Just us know. Lock them all in. <laughs> that's right. Just lock them in the dressing room. Put sleeping bags on the floor and. Well, let us know what you think about the Flames' playoff chances right now. You can vote, as always, on our website at firesidechat.ca. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash firesidechat, or on Twitter, we're at firesidepodcast. And let us know how you feel about the Flames' chances. We want to know if everyone's feeling pessimistic, if we're you know, feeling like they can do this, or are we really going to regret giving up that first pick? So uh, let us know what you think. Well, Matt, with... To move on uh, to what we usually do, which is the looking ahead, I want to actually just look ahead briefly to the rest of the season. Sure. As a whole. Cause 12 we games got 12 left. 12 games left. And if you look at it, we play the Oilers and the Coyotes twice apiece. They're terrible, and that's being polite. So that's four games where you really should win, like the Buffalo and Ottawa games. You should win. That gives us eight more games they, to they, deal with. You have three games against elite teams, Vegas at twice and Winnipeg, but the Vegas and one of the Vegas and Winnipeg games are the two very last games of the season, and because those teams can't really go anywhere up or down, they're more likely to just, you know, rest people and, eh, who cares? <laughs> so a good chance of possibly getting points there. Which leaves five games against teams that we're battling for. Basically, they're battling for their playoff lives, and so are we. And two against San Jose, one against Anaheim, LA, and Columbus. It's doable. As pessimistic as we've been, it is doable for the Flames to win a lot of games and actually make the playoffs. How realistic is that? We have to see. <laughs> I was gonna say it's it's doable. It's but the realism is you know almost as realistic as you or I getting the nod to be the next GM of this organization. I think. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I mean, yeah, it's doable. Anything's doable in the NHL. But if we look at the history of where this team's at and what they've done recently, what leads you to believe it's going to change? Yeah, like honestly, at this point, I don't see them finishing more than six and six, and probably in eleventh place. That's where I would guess. Probably like, oh, like say four, seven, and one or whatever. But whatever, like somewhere like not very good. <laughs> you know, and it's it's so interesting too because when I looked at the schedule at the beginning of the season, and I looked at this part of the season, going, you know, oh, we've got these games coming up, and you're looking, going, Vegas is going to be a, an easy win, and Arizona is going to be an easy win, and Edmonton's going to be an easy win, and you're going, you know what, this team can almost shut down the stars and start playing the backup guys, and now you're looking, going, like that Vegas game is not going to be the easy win we all thought it was going to be. Yeah, and it's frustrating, but hopefully, the Flames can get some magic going this week to like they have eight points on the board and boy do they need them all <laughs> well matt let's let's break that down then so looking at just the just the week ahead there's four games two at home and the flames taking on the edmonton oilers on tuesday then they get a two-day break and they take on the san jose sharks on friday then they go on their last back-to-back of the season and it's, of course, the road trip, the now what I think is going to be the regular road trip of doing Vegas and Arizona back-to-back on Sunday and Monday. So four four games, eight points on the board, two at home, two on the road. We need eight. Can we get eight? I'm expecting two. Ooh. 
That sucks, my yeah. friend. Yeah, and I think that would be the Arizona game. You don't even think we can beat Edmonton and Arizona. I'm thinking that like the only win of this week will be Arizona. But, uh, yeah, they if they get six points, which that is the bare minimum that they can get, and to crawl over that, oh, this was a decent week, and we're still alive... <laughs> Any less than six, I think you can just pretty much pack the tent and, you know, go home. But Well, I was going to move my next question to you is what game here becomes the drop dead? Well, they need to like, win. Like, you know, if we haven't won 500 game. by what game, do we? Well, they need to... They need San Jose. They need both San Jose games, I think, the 16th and the 24th. Yeah, they need the Anaheim and the LA game. Well, with the four of those games, they need three of them. You know, because it's unrealistic to expect four must-win games to win them all, but they need three and no loser points <laughs> So for the other team. So let's go through this week, Matt. So Calgary-Edmonton, who wins that one? They need it. I'm expecting Edmonton to win. I was going to say they need it, but can they do it? Edmonton's been like our kryptonite the last couple of years. Yeah, not just beating I us, but beating Edmund, us pretty bad. Yeah, I think the Oilers are probably going to win like something like six to one or something like that, and make it thoroughly embarrassing. So. And then Calgary takes on San Jose on Friday. Do they win? They need to. <laughs> they need to win all of these. I we would, could say that for every game here on out. Yeah, I I don't see it. I don't think that they're mentally tough enough to do it. What about Sunday in Vegas? No. <laughs> so you're thinking the only one they win is against Arizona? Yep. Uh, I think that you can just pretty much pack the tent by our, our next show. And then we can start looking forward to who we're going to recall to play the last handful of games. Who has the best handicap on the golf course? Yes. Because um, then our last couple weeks of shows, we can talk about how Rasmus Anderson's doing in the NHL or stuff like that. There you go. Or, yeah, I don't even know. Maybe we'll be talking about how Tanner Glass is going on a tear, fighting for his job next year. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens here. I'm I'm expecting this week, I'm going to be a little more optimistic. I'm expecting Calgary beat Edmonton because they have to. And I expect them to beat Arizona. I think San Jose and Vegas are better teams than us. And they're going to show that they're better teams than us. Yep. Um, uh, it's all about preparation. If the Flames come out prepared to play... They could easily do eight. It's just uh, that has been what we've been talking about since October. So, What lineup changes yeah. did you make this week? Uh, Versteeg in and probably Hathaway out, and that's about it. You and think, Shore yeah. in somewhere. You wouldn't put Stewart in? No. Maybe it's against the Sharks. You know, I would almost be tempted he to put... he does do well against them. I'd almost be tempted to put Tanner Glass in against the Oilers. Yeah. Put a little, put a little muscle in the lineup. I don't know who you'd take out, maybe. I don't know. Probably Staging. Hathaway. Either way, I think Hathaway. Yeah, that too. Why not? Well, Matt, it'll be an interesting week. We'll talk again next week when we have eight games left to play, and hopefully the Flames will... Uh... Hopefully we're talking in a positive manner instead of downerville downers like tonight yeah hopefully we'll be looking at it and saying okay these flames they're doing some good and they can actually make the playoffs and we hope to hear from everyone else and see what their reaction is going to be after these four games yeah because then if the flames are actually in a decent spot then we have three absolutely amazingly pivotal games that will make or break the flame season next week if they actually do somehow get six or eight points this week like the game against Anaheim, the game against San Jose, and the game against LA, like you couldn't ask for three better opponents in the late season to go up against. I think either way, those are going to be fun hockey games to watch, but I'd like to come in above on those games than below. Yeah, that'd be nice. In the standings. Yeah. Well, Matt, let's enjoy this week, and, and I will check. We need the oh. out of town scoreboard to be good as well. We need the out of town scoreboard to be good. Well, and I think that's a big thing here that people are forgetting is the Flames, I don't think, even if they make it in, I don't think they can do this on their own. I think that this year is going to require a lot of help from teams around us. 
And that's always makes me nervous too when your fate's not in your own hands. True. So Matt, enjoy the week, and hopefully we are on the higher end than the lower end of points for this week. We need six. Can we get eight? We'll find out. There's like an old 60s Batman. Can the Flames get eight points this week? Find out next time. Same Flames time, same Flames channel. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Have a good night. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.